So it's certainly, I've got a lot of traffic um, in terms of members of the NHT and friends on Twitter asking me about what. Okay, so I'm delighted to offer some real experts in the field of early years education. Uh, people that I respect really highly in terms of their input and their contribution to early years over a number of years. So um, we've got Ruth Swales. Can you say hello, Ruth, just so. Hi, Simon. Hi, everybody. Hi, Ruth. We've got Jan de Beel. Hi, Jan. And we've got David Wright. Good morning morning okay so uh, we are going to be discussing some of the challenges we've got around early years now Ruth I'm going to bring you in first because I know that you've got your ear close to the ground I know that mm -hmm. you are well connected as a school improvement advisor and also as a early years consultant uh, for lots of our early years settings and lots of our schools so what are you hearing from the ground um, in terms of what people are concerned about Ruth um, just a lot of anxiety about mixed messages at the moment um, I think um, quite a lot of anger as well that early years were missed off the original announcement apart from reception it was Monday when we found out that PVI and nursery were going to open and then it, there's been a lack of clarity so I think there's a lot of confusion around about are all nursery expected to be back um, you know lots of the guidance is quite problematic um, we had in total we've had 15 pieces of guidance in the course of a week and only one of those is referred specifically to early years that came out on Friday and it's very contradictory. It contradicts the guidance from the day before and it contradicts itself halfway through. So it actually says, you know, um, we're opening to all children in early years. And then later on, it says only for key workers. Um, so there's a lot of confusion um, and there's a lot of anxiety about what can we make available and, and how do we run what is an, you know, effective early years provision that's right for children, but also that is, is safe and how do we manage um, there's a lot of confusion about do we need to manage social distancing so lots of the guidance from the government says we don't but then we get politicians on on the television talking about social distancing and you know on Saturday we had somebody suggesting that um, children in nursery could socially distance at their work desks um, and when I just mm -hmm. finished rolling around on the floor laughing at that idea um, you know it, it really is quite confusing for people um, so lots and lots of questions about rotors, lots of questions about bubbles, how do we make that work, can we limit um, the number of children who come in, that's, that's a really big question that keeps coming up, and also what about staff who are not vulnerable themselves but are living with somebody who's vulnerable and how do we manage things like that. And I've been quite lucky in that I've been making some connections with people in occupational health um, and I've put some guidance on my website yesterday and I'm going to put some more on today um, but this morning I've had a conversation via email with um, a I'm trying to remember what it's called is a consultant occupational physician and I've put some questions to him and he's been very helpful in coming back with some very clear answers about what we should and shouldn't be doing um, not all the answers yet but we are going to try to draw up some sector specific guidance to help with that so yeah um, lots and lots and lots of questions and not many answers at the moment and you know a feeling that we need some guidance sooner rather than later because the first of june is is fast approaching yeah i know that um some of my schools locally they're finding it quite hard especially as the government's tasking us with open our nurseries and reception first then mm. that's quite a challenge we feel a bit more comfortable in terms of opening our um our settings for year six and year one currently so uh, that's a real challenge um, yeah. sticking to that timeline and that time frame and my biggest thing is can i offer a a high quality early learning early years experience with some of those restrictions and that's uh, that's really challenging my team and my team are on the call today so hopefully we're going to go and uh, do some thinking around that and then start making some plans it's a huge so, challenge yeah I'm, I'm what seeing would be what would be your tips Ruth in terms of uh, providing mm. that high quality early learning experience within some of the restrictions that we have I'm seeing lots of people stripping right back to the bare minimum and you know I think what people are doing is they're taking things out um, and, and arranging their environments but that can look really really stark and that worries me because I worry about children coming back to that and whether that is appropriate and, and we have to think about the emotional needs of children and the idea that you know your classroom is going to look very different but if it looks so starkly different that, that's going to have a significant impact on children's well-being so I think it's a case of really thinking through and following the advice that we're going to share this morning about you know is it washable is it something that we can clean how can we minimise the risk of transfer of virus, um, you know, 
and, and what is achievable you know looking at each resource and thinking can I, can I provide a version of that in a COVID friendly way. I mean, some of the guidance that, that Tony, who I spoke to this morning, um, gave me was to think about um, COVID age is something that he talked about for your staff. Um, so he said that the, basically the most important message is that vulnerability rates for staff relate mostly to age. So young teachers and TAs, and I'm reading directly from the email here, are most safe despite having um, the Public Health England listed conditions while older teachers and TAs are vulnerable and should social distance effectively, meaning that what I suggested that they need to be able to do in early years is not possible. They cannot perform those roles. Mm -hmm. uh, but he says mm -hmm. that risk can be substantially reduced with PPE and only FFP3 masks should be worn, not surgical masks, not DIY face covering. Good hygiene, good hand washing, suitable clothes that can be changed into at work, changed out to before leaving work, Bag to take home, wash safely each, each day. He said it's not ideal, but that can help. So, so for teachers who, for leaders who are thinking about their staff right now, if you've got somebody who is younger, um, they are less vulnerable, and it might be ideal to to think about moving people around according to um, what he calls their COVID age. He said it's a little bit like a smoker's age. You know, you you can be 25 but have the lungs of a 50 year old, and certain conditions. Uh, add to your COVID age. He sent me a link to a document from the Association of Local Authority Medical Advisors and I'm going to share that on Twitter after this Corona cast so hopefully that will be useful. He did say it's a difficult period of transition because they're awaiting peer review and publication so this is a draft document. He was very very clear about that and he wanted me to share that with you. He's happy to share that. Um, so hopefully that will help you to think about you know the things about social distancing and then it literally is a case of going through each resource and thinking can i make it covid friendly really good advice i read covid age covid friendly i think my covid age has gone up by about 20 years in the last eight <laughs> weeks so um that's going okay i'm going to just bring in paul whiteman because he's a little uh, i think paul whiteman's with us i just wanted paul just to speak for a quick minute paul's a general secretary of the national association of head teachers the union for school leaders paul could you just say hello and just uh um, and just go and say um, where we're up to in terms of our union and in terms of the early years sector. Well, hi everybody. So, sorry, uh, Simon, I was busy typing away there thinking I was just listening rather than participating. So, uh, sorry if I look a, a little bit jumped uh, in there. So, um, there's not a huge amount to report that isn't in the public domain right now um, across all settings, let alone early years. Uh, we're still engaging with government right now to try and get underneath um, some of the science they say they have and they've been asserting over the weekend that they have to support their decision to return or why they say the science is going in the right direction. I think that comes from some of what I was just listening to, to there and there's a lot of emerging science, a lot of emerging um, kind of advice that's coming through but yet to be peer reviewed and yet to have scientific certainty that I think everybody would, would like. So that, that work's still ongoing. And I think it's kind of a twin track for me right now. Uh, the reason I wanted to come into this this uh, broadcast this morning or this Zoom meeting this morning was to hear what it's like in terms of what you're doing as well as hear from government about their ambitions. And we're doing a, a much wider uh, broadcast tomorrow if anybody uh, hasn't picked it up yet, where I hope to be bringing those two things together. So here we're on the ground here, the services that can be clean, the car can be clean, and understanding is exactly what it's like in your settings is absolutely essential to me right now so that I can I can make sure that the, the government is hearing your, your voice and authentically hearing it. Um, I think the thing for me is to give you a degree of hope I, I, I shut down for now, but the more I talk to government, the more serious I think they are about the flexibilities that they're, they're trying to include in their advice. And one of the things I'm trying to do is, is to invite them more into the public domain about talking about those flexibilities so that we can manage the expectation of parents that actually it's not all of the year groups and everybody in those year groups that might have access to a place uh, from uh, from the 1st of June. It's about the art of what we have and what we know rather than flicking the switch. So, so I, mean, I don't know if that's, that's kind of just the, the, the brew yeah, that's, that's 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 you wanted, but I'm going to be on the call for a while. So if you need to invite okay. me in for questions or anything throughout, I'd be more than happy to do that. That's really helpful, really I think. I, I'm loving seeing everybody's bookcases, by the way. I'm going to have to build one behind me. 
<laughs> Great. Thank you, Paul. That's really helpful. And I think the, the issue we have is around, we don't quite know the evidence around, do our youngest children in the earlier settings, do they, do they shed it as readily as some of our older people? But um, I'm really interested to explore um, Ruth's concept of COVID age. Okay, I'm going to bring in Jan now, because I know Jan's been, Jan de Beel's an international renowned early years educator, and I know Jan's always got something very wise to say about what's going on globally. So Jan, you've got about 10 minutes. Is that okay to just go and um, fill us in of what you've been uh, discovering is, is happening around the world? Um, well, uh, to start with, it's, it's quite interesting how Britain has responded to it in terms of the rest of the world. Um, I mean, I'll just give you a kind of a bit of context. Most countries have taken the decision to close schools until the end of the academic year. Um, which clearly we, we, we in England we're, or in Britain we're, we're not doing um, because of the, the, the uh, health and uh, you know, risk risk of cross infection and so on. So we are sitting outside that a little bit. Um, the country that's obviously come into prominence is Denmark, um, and I say that as a part Danish. My mum's Danish or was Danish um, as the kind of example because they appear to be. Uh, three or four weeks, a month or so ahead of us. Um, and their, their children have actually gone back into kindergartens. I'll come back to them in a minute. The other interesting thing to point out is uh, I have a lot of links with China. In China, the, when, certainly in Shanghai, for example, the approach was very much to start with the oldest children first, to integrate them in, give it two weeks to see whether there was any spike, and then the next section, so on. So their kindergarten children are about to go back now. Um, and uh, you may have seen on there's quite a lot of footage out there on social media of some of the processes that they've got in place, which I, I think we we you know we, we will replicate. So going back to Denmark, um, they are sort of several weeks ahead of us, so it is a very useful in some ways. And there are big caveats, which I'll come to in a minute. It is a useful example to look at what they're doing and how they're approaching it, particularly in their early years. They have um, an element, a kindergarten elementary system, so the reception in year one children would be in a kindergarten. And actually, that is more constrained because that means their, their areas are smaller. But I would just need to point out, caveats with Denmark are, number one, there are, there are more people, significantly more people who live in London than in the whole of Denmark. It is a very, very small country. So towns are small, cities are small. They have very easy access to outdoor areas. They come from a forest school tradition and so on. And, and literally, because of the numbers involved, the, the, the kind of curve and the, the cross infection and so on is, is very, very different. So they are at a different place to us, but there are, there are reasons, reasons for that. So um, what's been interesting um, with the Danish model is um, I think what they're finding in terms of the retransition. And I think some of the key, key principles, which I mean, I'll touch on some of them uh, that, that they've come across. One of the things that they've stressed massively is the connection with parents and talking to parents about what children are going to experience and how it'll be different and also getting a view on parents about how feasible and how possible that is. So all the way through their communication, that, sorry, all the way through their processes is a very strong communication with parents um, the whole way through. And I, I think that's something which I think we should certainly, certainly consider. Pa parents need to know. <laughs> In, if this all goes ahead on, on the 1st of June, less than two weeks, uh, what kind of experience their children are going to get and how significantly different it's going to be. Um, and, and we're all in, everyone, everyone in the world with, who's concerned with children is in that balance of the risk of COVID-19 and the impact that will have on children and the people around them, and also the impact and the consequences of being socially isolated in lockdown for that amount of time. So everything that we take is going to be a balance on those things. And you know, it's also worth pointing out, because I've touched on it already today, that COVID, it will be with us for a while. I, I think some people, me included, probably thought it would suddenly end as dramatically as it started. And it, it won't. It's going to taper off for some time. Uh, someone from WHO said last week it will be around forever and it will be like HIV and measles and we'll just have to learn to manage it. And the, the risk of it will get, get lower and lower, but we will still have to have processes in place. Um, the other thing we don't know, which I picked up from one of the briefings, is we don't know if this is seasonal. Because um, it's a new virus, there might be peaks every autumn and every winter, but we don't know that at the moment. So the processes we're putting in place, and I think some of the foci of what we need to do, are, are going to be with us for some time, certainly in the short to medium term, perhaps even longer than that. 
So um, one of the things that they've talked about um, a lot is how they've managed the environments. And I've noticed lots of questions coming up about that. That is a, a really key, key concern. Uh, so they have stripped out everything that is not, that is not machine washable. They are washing everything every day, sometimes more than once a day. And the way they're doing it is they're putting it in a washing machine and putting it on 80 degrees. And apparently that is uh, sufficient to, to, to kill it. So um, in terms of environment, and Ruth's talked about it already, we, you need to be very, very careful and considerate about how appropriate those resources are going to be. So things that aren't washable in that way, I would argue that you can't really have them um, in, in that environment. One of the things I would say, environment, it's not an issue in Denmark, but it, it, it appears to be a, a sort of creeping issue in, in England. Um, and I've noted, again, some, a couple of things already. The EYFS is still the statutory requirement. This is not a reason to radically Victorianise EYFS classrooms. They do not need to be like that, and they shouldn't be like that. It will be immensely damaging to children of nursery and reception to go into a desk-based environment. It will not be what they expect. It will not be what they're used to. It will not be, be good for them. So Michael Gove, and in, you know, in defence of Michael Gove, um, he was talking about desk. I think he, and I hope he was talking about older primary school boots because it's absolutely not appropriate for young children. You can have a type of environment that children are used to. It will be different. It will be limited. The resources will be different. But I would absolutely say you must, you must, must have errors provision in the same way that you would have had before, similar to you would have had before. Now, there are issues around that. And again, the, the Dan, Danish um, kindergartens have been looking at that. So you will look at resources, as I say, that are easily cleanable. You will look at resources that are not going to uh, transfer the virus. It's generally agreed that children of this age um, are unable to social dis socially distance. And also it's not desirable for them to do so. And we're back again in that balance. If we are teaching them to be terrified of other people at this age in that way, that is going to have long-term impact on them psychologically. This happened to me the other day, actually, walking uh, where I lived. I'd been shopping and I walked past, um, there was a parent with, uh, at a cash point, and two of children, I think they were about five or six years old, with masks on. And when they saw me, they screamed and ran behind her. I mean, that does happen to me anyway. But um, I did wonder, these people, are, children are growing up in an environment where we are, are actually teaching them to be terrified of other people getting anywhere near them. Now we have to mitigate the risks, but we also have to put that into, into, into context. And what they do in Denmark is they accept that in the bubble, the bubble doesn't mix with other bubbles, but within that bubble, social distancing is not possible in the same way. So you take the necessary precautions, you build in hygiene and hand washing is absolutely as part of the curriculum. I know Ruth has talked about this. We need a curriculum about hygiene and hand washing, and that is part of the day, and children take responsibility for it and so on. They have as, um, other elements like each child has their own personalised resources, so uh, scissors, pencils, and um, colouring pencils, uh, and so on. And only they use them, and they only use them at school, and they're washed every day, things like that. We can mitigate some of the risks to some degree as they have done, but we have to, to put that uh, in context. Um, I'm, I'm really wondering, and I'm, I'm waiting for advice on this, but I'm really wondering as I'm thinking about different resource areas, I would prioritize uh, mark making, small world, because it's going to be a lot about storytelling and reenacting experiences, um, small construction. The area I'm really thinking about is the book area. Um, what we do know about the viruses and viruses in general is they live on materials like paper for up to five days. So um, essentially, ideally, we, we can't really have a book area unless, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking aloud here, unless we quarantine books when they've been in the section for four or five days and we have a kind of rolling programme where books have been out of circulation for five days and then they can be reintegrated. One of the other things the um, Danish, Danish um, kindergarten is doing is they're um, having shared resources. So each group has their own typical um, sort of what we call uh, standard resources. But a resource box does a rotation of each class. So each day a child, the children get access to different, different resources. And again, that's cleaned every day, uh, washed thoroughly, disinfected. And, and so they get some form of uh, fluidity in those resources because they will not be able to access um, the range of resources they used to. I was a bit um, perturbed to see a photograph from a supplier 
yesterday who was advertising um, resources. And in those resources, there are things which are totally in, um, inappropriate, things like feathers, things like soft materials. Um, we do need to reinforce the message that we have to be very, very careful about the resources we choose so that we mitigate those risks um, to, to, to as much as we can. And that's my 10 minutes. A lot more to say, but it might come out in the questions. And, and, well, I'll post up, Jan. You were involved in a, a conference with some uh, Danish educators uh, last week, mm -hmm. weren't you? So mm -hmm. we'll, I'll post that on my Twitter feed because I know my earliest team had seen that conference and found it hugely helpful. But that was a um, really helpful 10 minutes, Jan. And um, well, I'm going to move on to David now. David Wright, who uh, goes and runs the uh, Paint Potter Nurseries down in Southampton. David, you've been open for eight weeks. Um, not all your settings, I, I believe, but you've been open with our youngest children. I'd just like to share what your learning has been over the last five weeks. Well, um, thank you, Simon. I, I really relate to what Judy said just before we started, which was um, this notion that as a leader, we've got all the answers to every question for, you know, reassuring parents and anybody else. And, um, you know, the question we all have in the back of our mind is, what if we get this wrong? You know, that weight of responsibility we all hold for, for doing the right thing is quite a challenge for us. But I would say my two watchwords are proportionality and practicality. And I very much endorse what uh, Ruth and Jan have both said. You know, what we're trying to create here is an environment in which children who will have had varying experiences throughout lockdown need to come in and feel that they own, that they are comfortable in and that we're providing that a safe and nurturing space for them. And I would suggest for children under the age of five, children of six and so on, it's not appropriate for them to be physically distanced. I really don't like that social distancing terminology, but physically distanced. And, you know, in thinking about bubbles and how we do that, particularly in the PVI sector, that's a huge spectrum of different provision. We've got single child minders through to, um, you know, chains of nurseries and um, what that looks like in any context and context is everything isn't it will very much depend on you know the physical layout of the buildings that we've got where we can put um, things and, and what we can do with those resources so I think you know we have to bear that emotional welfare in mind equally as much as we do um, making sure that we've got the health and safety aspects right and not forgetting that we've got that um, duty of care to our team as well and very much as Jan says prioritizing who should be working with those children and if somebody is at risk maybe we don't involve them and I think we have the right to say which children are coming in and which staff are going to work with them and under what circumstances so dictating the hours you know for us for example who's going to do the cleaning who pays for that cleaning and, and when is that going to happen and you know it may be that you don't have a washing machine on site well well what then how are you going to work that out and all of these practical things that we've all got to get in place by the first of june has to be doable so you know what we've done to date is um with small groups of children in um with with effectively bubbles um but you've got things like what happens when somebody needs to go to the loo what happens over lunch hours you know you can't have somebody there from seven in the morning till six at night monday to friday with the same group of children and the other thing that happens um, in our settings is not everybody accesses us every day in the same way so we might have a different group of children monday morning to tuesday afternoon well then that does that mean we've got to have two separate bubbles with two separate adults working with them so there's all these permutations of um you know mixing children and adults and how do we mitigate the risk in in those terms and those are serious considerations in in setting this up other things to think about is um you know getting children in in the morning and again we may have children who are very anxious about leaving their home because they'll have been fed those subliminal messages or even you know explicitly from their parents that the world is a dangerous place and you've been away for eight, nine weeks, and now you're coming back, you don't want to be confronted with someone in full PPE who's wrestling you out of your pushchair and, and throwing you into a building. But you might be very upset as a small person, and what you need is comfort and security and encouragement. So how do we manage that at, at the door, um, you know, 
when we're getting people in and first thing, do we get them to use the doorbell? Is everybody ringing the doorbell? Are we cleaning the doorbell in between everybody using the doorbell? Or do we have somebody manning the, the front of the, the building to get people in? Are we allowing parents in? We're not. Um, so, you know, this whole idea of settling children is going to be a, another area that we're, we're looking at. I would have to say that what we've aimed for is normality in the sense of, you know, this is somewhere that we're doing what we were always doing, as Jan says, it is EYFS, it's not something else and it's not stark. Um, but we are doing that rotation of resources. We are trying to clean as much as possible. But our experience has been that we've had no incidents of any transferal of uh, virus from between children or to um, the team who's working with them. So we, we're just gonna carry on doing that. And, and we're trying to put out, you know, again, I go back, what if I get it wrong? But I can only go on what we've seen. I, I would say the best advice I've seen so far is what you had from Matt Butler. And if anybody hasn't seen that Corona cast, I would suggest you all watch it because I thought that was very practical, very down to earth guidance. We need the science and we need reassurance. What we don't want from government is prescription and directives um, that are unhelpful and not um, you know, supportive of what we're going to do. Um, so th that, that's where it's at with us. You know, it's working up till now. We're scaling it up. But again, what I'm saying in that is we are not in any way anticipating that we're going to run a full nursery. We're not anticipating that we can meet everybody's needs in terms of hours and, and needs. And let's remind ourselves, we're dealing with human beings here. So we can't have a system that is rigid. It has to meet every individual's needs in terms of what's appropriate and, and what, what we can do. Thanks, David. That's really helpful. And, uh, you know, making your, doing your best endeavours around this. I know our special school colleagues have the term best endeavours attached yes. to their children they're working with. I think that would be usually helpful if we could have some sort of application around that for earlier. Paul Whiteman, do you want to say anything around um, what our three speakers have said? Paul Whiteman, yeah. You, you, keep, you keep doing that to me, Simon. Sorry. <laughs> well, I think just finishing on the, on, on the best endeavours thing. I mean, what we can see is, is there's lots of kind of encouraging narrative as well as the more frightening narrative around and there's a competition of science and a competition of advice and it's about selecting uh, what's going to work for us and I'm just finishing on that best endeavours um, uh, kind of description that you use there Simon I keep getting drawn back to the art of the possible and utilising the flexibilities that will be in the government guidance to, to support individual settings. I think that's that's probably where we end up. Whilst I've been listening to that, I've just been responding to the uh, the checklist that's been put out, uh, I think it was yesterday or late on the evening of the day before by uh, our colleague unions. Um, and yeah, my, my view on that is, look, there's some useful stuff in there, but it's it's deliberately in one direction of travel rather than helping us assess uh, whether there's anything we can do and I'm still in the business of saying assess what we can do uh, rather rather than, than what we can't do so I think some really helpful narrative there um, but we're still waiting for the government I think to to, to flesh that out and say uh, why it pervert why it can assert with such confidence um, that it that it's asking you to de deliver what what's being asked at the moment so I don't know if that's helpful but I should yeah. now start typing and give you a lot more attention uh, now I've now got that advice out to members more generally I can you can have my full attention now Simon and perhaps you'll get a coherent answer out of me if you ask me no I think that's great and, and the one thing within the um, other union guidance is the two meter social distancing we don't you know that's I think we all accept as educators whether you educate children from um, from naught to 16 that it's pretty impossible to to um, have that social distancing happening in the education environment. Okay, I'm going to move on to questions. So Emily, are you going to work, curate the questions for us and then we'll, um, I'll fire them off to one of our um, guests or try and answer it myself if that's okay. Yeah, we've got loads and loads of questions on the chat so I really do hope I'm going to cover as much as possible Yeah, in 10 minutes. So I'm going to start with early years. So there's lots and lots of questions around two-year-old provision and also two settings. What do we do if children are accessing two settings? Because effectively they are breaking bubbles by accessing two settings. Um, again, under fives can't be tested. So what do we do with those if they do show signs and symptoms? Um, and lots of questions again around resources, outdoor sand pits, things like that. 
and changing of children in early years. How do we manage that? And what is the guidance and support around that? I think Ruth, potentially you're the best person to ask for the advice. Mm. <laughs> I'll, help, I'll help you out Ruth in the first one, give you some thinking time. So um, okay. when, we, when we met with Matt Butler um, a few weeks ago, he talked about the PPE requirements on his video around changing nappies, about uh, eye protection um, and face masks. So please watch that video. Um, I'll repost on Twitter and Matt's joining us again on Thursday for any specific questions. I want to ask Matt about, Matt about washing equipment. If we haven't got washing machines in our school, will 80 degrees soapy water um, rinsed off? Will that be good enough? Um, so we'll ask Matt specifically about that. Ruth, do you want to pick up on dual settings and um, yeah. the other question? I found Matt's guidance really helpful as well. Um, dual settings, there's a little bit of, um, again, ambiguity around it, because on the one hand, it says wherever possible, children should remain in bubbles. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mm -hmm. say in any of the guidance that you can't attend two settings. What I will be doing and my message about all of this will be communicate with your parents as much as you can, make it really, really clear that every time they introduce another set of people to their child, they um, increase the risk of transmission. You've got to be really, really clear with people about you can't make promises you can't keep. So you are going to give your best endeavours to keep your children safe and you will make sure that the hygiene is of the highest quality that you can possibly provide but you cannot promise that children will be um, kept covid free because if they're going into different settings you have no control over that so otherwise i would i would advise against but you, if the parent makes the choice that is a parental choice and similarly can I, can I, oh. go on go on yeah you go first no can i echo that and i can say you know <laughs> My, my instinct, and I, I, I think it, the responsible instinct here is to err on the side of caution and to also acknowledge this, this will get better and there will be points along the way where we can take decisions like that. But the mo I mean, that, that, <laughs> that does frighten me, what, what that idea of two settings, because you are, you're, you're immediately cross-fertilising, cross, cross not just that child, but all the child that they've been with, that they've been with, and the other children that they're with the second time. So actually, you, you multiply that out, it gets... It gets so I, I, I would err on the side of caution that and say this is something we will review as the R rate goes down, as things, you know, become less. Maybe those are kind of things we could loosen up. But that, one of the things I've been when I've talked to schools, I've been really firm about is that those bubbles can't change. They, they have to remain constant and, and they, they can't change. Yeah. Can your parents really yeah. kick off. <laughs> I mean, that, then that's a, a process for, for deciding who's together. The minute they change, it drives a coach and horses through all the mitigating, um, mitigating the risk. Yeah. So, and, 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 you know, just to repeat, that will, that will change over time, but we need to, to, to prioritise that at this point. Yeah. A very specific example of that is wraparound care. So we're not running any of our out of school um, provision because exactly as Jan's just said, you know, everybody's in their bubble and then all of a sudden all year groups are in together in, in before or after school care. And, that, and that's come up in the questions actually so lots of people have asked about the key worker groups and do they go to their own year groups can we offer extended provision if they do etc etc um, i think from our position a lot of our parents want them back in their year groups if they're in those year groups for their peer support and that building of their well-being and stuff so i do think we've got to consider that carefully and like you've said before and after school care despite the government you know identifying that it is if possible to continue it i don't think we can do that with bubbles i really don't no, no. The issue around after school care is that um, on Thursday night it was it was it was quite strong guidance against doing it unless you could actually absolutely social distance the children and then that guidance changed on Friday night that we should do it. So what's changed in the science in 24 hours would be my question. But I desperately want to offer wraparound care because some of my families that work in the hospitals are absolutely reliant on that and have been reliant on it for seven weeks the last eight weeks so that's a real conundrum isn't it the before and after school care okay yeah, and i think we've got to make individual school decisions haven't we that's best for our own our own environments but if it is the key worker group they will have to remain the same if they're accessing before and after school care otherwise you are breaking those bubbles absolutely, um, absolutely. okay lots of questions around staff refusing to engage what's the union advice on this um, or if they don't, if they just don't want to, obviously any year we've issued lots of letters, not engagement on the 1st of June, which has caused a lot of headache for head teachers. Um, so lots and lots of questions around that. And again, the COVID age comes up in that as well. Um, what, what are the concerns around the COVID age? What about if they don't know the children? And can staff actually sue employers if, if they're forced to work and they don't want to? 
So I don't know if Paul potentially could come in on. I can answer this, Paul, if you want me to, uh, if you want some thinking time. I uh, well, can no, give the advice we've given previously. We, we, you, you go ahead, Simon, and then if you're right, I, I won't say a thing, but if I start <laughs> talking after you, then you, you know so I don't the end, But it may, come up. it may have been a, an opportunity for, for me to redeem myself because I actually listened to that question, so you'll get to hear an answer. <laughs> we've had this question a number of times over the, on the CoronaCast since it started, and the, um, and the advice has been is if people can work from home, then they can do, but of course, with frontline services, and that's quite hard in some of our jobs, so um, that's the first thing. The second thing is if people are really anxious, I would encourage staff to have a conversation with their, their GP to go and see what the GP goes and says, whether um, you know whether their anxiety is stopping them from working. I've also offered members of staff the opportunity for unpaid leave as well. So that's all the things I would do before I had that conversation with my HR provider. Um, but ultimately, I would be talking to my HR provider if I thought that, um, um, that uh, somebody should be working and, um, and and they were just uh, trying to um, use use something which wasn't an appropriate um, appropriate reason. Paul, uh, do you want to add anything to that? I, I'd, I'd agree with that if I were you, Simon, um, uh, because I've had staff ask from local schools what they can do and I've said be sensitive, listen to their needs, you know, try and understand them, try and provide alternatives for them if possible, but if they're still outright no, then at the end of the day we've got paying conditions that need to come into place. So I think to add? if I can add to it, Simon, just very briefly, that, I mean, the, the government does have emergency powers of compulsion that it can use in terms of school opening and things like that, that it hasn't relied upon yet. And I, and I think the reason it's not relying upon those is it knows it will only be successful with this if it's done in cooperation uh, with everybody understanding over a period of time. So I think really what we need to be talking about here is trying to engage with staff. If staff are following the instructions of their unions not to engage, then okay, it means that you're slightly less sighted on their concerns than you would have been and you're not able to respond to those concerns immediately. That's gonna come later, which is unfortunate, but, uh, but, but that's the path that uh, those unions are following right now. Um, but if we look at this in the context of, you know, this is gonna be with us for a, for a while, and I was taken by what Jan was saying about it being around for a while and how long it might be. We are gonna face this, this pinch point at some point, whether it's now, whether it's in September, whether it's at the end of the calendar year, we are gonna have this debate at some point. So we might as well confront it now because we've been asked to. And I think it's about uh, building confidence over a period of time about what we can do. And the most confident thing we're gonna to have to say as school leaders right now is to look government in the eye sometimes and say, we can't deliver all that you've asked of us now. We can only do the best with what we've got. So if we've only got, you know, 50% of staff available to us, we think there's about 70% of staff available right now, but if that drops to 50, then you've only got those members of staff available to you. And if you begin to rely on compulsion or uh, contracts of employment and things like that, I think actually that works against the overall effort going forward. So a much more understanding approach. Those of you that, uh, that are members of the NHT, I'll be saying an awful lot more about that tomorrow evening on our, on, on our much bigger, uh, crowdcast. The reason I'm not going further now is because I've not written it yet, uh, but but uh, we'll we'll certainly be dealing with that in some detail tomorrow night as well. Okay, that's great. Now that's all the time. I'm sorry we've not been able to have too many questions there, but um, what we will do is we'll, we'll we'll capture on the chat and we'll pick them up at uh, future Corona Cast. We do have Matt Butler with us on Thursday, but we will have time to look at some of those questions in more depth. I know Ruth has been a regular attender, and I want to thank David as well, who's joined us before, and Jan, who's a first timer. So thank you so much for joining us and giving us up your time. I'm going to leave the last. Um, closing comments for Judy who's just going to summarise uh, the meeting for us and a few key points and then um, I, will, I will end the meeting and um, I'm going to make sure that we capture those questions that we haven't been able to answer. Thanks Simon I think like so many of the conversations it opens up so many more my head was buzzing when I landed and it's buzzing as I go out now to speak to my staff I'll just say it's fantastic to get um, finally a recognition with this particular group of people of the very specific and unique challenge that we've got in the early years because we're not hearing that recognition from the government guidance and we're certainly not hearing it from those that step up to the podiums at the time every day. There's um, some ridiculous comments have been out there about what small children do and don't do. Um, for me, um, Jan, Ruth, David, some really practical thought-provoking ideas there. One that I'll be going to speak to staff about is 
uh, they're working in the reception class at the moment. Will you just look at each resource? First of all, check if it's washable, whatever degrees. We haven't got a washing machine in school. Where can we get one from? Um, and but what version of that resource or that area can we present in a child-friendly, COVID-friendly way? Uh, from Jan being so clear and honest with parents, uh, and that timely reminder that these processes are going to be with us for such a long time, that's quite sobering, as is the fact that we could actually be damaging children by putting them off human contacts. That one really struck a chord with me. Um, and David, your emphasis there on emotional welfare, there's a lot being said about how much we can do to catch them up in their educational attainment. Uh, I think for us, for all of us, to be honest, but particularly in early years, we've got to seriously put emotional welfare um, first. I'll finish on that. This is a highly emotive um, situation and we've got not just the school leaders, we've got the emotions of the children to think about when they come back. We're also this morning, or in your own time frame, there dealing with very emotional parents. Um, we've got staff, uh, really wide ranging levels of anxiety to manage. Um, my, my final word is um, thanks to everybody, but also you've got to look after yourselves as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, everybody. 340 plus on the uh, cast today. So thank you, everybody, for engagement. Hopefully we'll see some of you again on Thursday because we've opt our subscription to a thousand Zoomers. So uh, bye, everybody. Thanks for joining in. Stay safe. Thanks, everybody. You, uh, Take care. See you soon. Bye. Bye.